steps forward. Anyways, Pastor Whitty. Well, good morning. It is wonderful to be here, wonderful to be with you uh, without being too close with you. <laughs> Wednesday is Canada Day. Yay, and what a blessing to live in this country. That reminds me of the story of the pastor who recognized that the church needed a new roof and the service was actually on July 1st. They had a worship service. So the pastor said, would there be anybody in the congregation or those people in the congregation who would like to donate $1,000 for the roof, please stand up. And then he had the organist play O Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're not going to do that. We don't need a new roof. But let's, let's bow our heads in prayer as we thank God for this wonderful country. Almighty God and Father, on this Canada Day week, bless our nation and all its people. Help each of us to appreciate our freedom as Canadians, and make us faithful citizens of our country. Bless our Queen, Elizabeth, our Prime Minister, our Premier, and help them to lead with honesty, humility, justice, and diligence. Give us generous hearts so that people in need may be fed, clothed, and educated. Let our country be a beacon of hope to nations throughout the world. We pray in the name of Jesus, our help, our hope, our strength, our being. Amen. As Christians, God wants us to look in two directions. And of course, they're symbolized by the cross, aren't they? He wants us to look up. To look up to him because we need his strength. And then he wants us to look sideways. And he wants us to look at the people around us and their needs and the ways we, as ambassadors for Jesus, can help them. Well, that's what we're going to talk about in the sermon today. The sermon, um, well, we'll get there when we get there. But let's stand and let's begin our worship together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And you may be seated. to experience are true. They will change your life if you let them. For they come from the very heart of God. He loves you. And He is the Father you have been looking for all your life. This is His love letter. are written in my book. 
I determined the exact time of your birth and where you would live. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. I knit you together in your mother's womb and brought you forth on the day you were born. I have been misrepresented by those who don't know me. I am not distant and angry, but am the complete expression of love. And it is my desire to lavish my love on you, simply because you are my child and I am your father. I offer you more than your earthly father ever could, for I am the perfect father. Every good gift that you receive comes from my hand, for I am your provider and I meet all your needs. My plan for your future has always been filled with hope because I love you with an everlasting love. My thoughts toward you are countless as the sand on the seashore and I rejoice over you with singing. I will never stop doing good to you. You are my treasured possession. I desire to establish you with all my heart and all my soul. And I want to show you great and marvelous things. If you seek me with all your heart, you will find me. Delight in me and I will give you the desires of your heart. For it is I who gave you those desires. I am able to do more for you than you could possibly imagine. I am your greatest encourager. I am also the Father who comforts you in all your troubles. When you are brokenhearted, I am close to you. As a shepherd carries a lamb, I have carried you close to my heart. One day, I will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and I'll take away all the pain you have suffered on this earth. I am your Father, and I love you even as I love my son Jesus. For in Jesus my love for you is revealed. He is the exact representation of my being. He came to demonstrate that I am for you, not against you, and to tell you that I am not counting your sins. Jesus died so that you and I could be reconciled. His death was the ultimate expression of my love for you. I gave up everything I love that I might gain your love. If you receive the gift of my son Jesus, you receive me. And nothing will ever separate you from my love again. Come home and I'll throw the biggest party heaven has ever seen. I have always been father and will always be father. My question is, will you be my child? I am waiting for you. Love, your dad. Almighty God. Let's stand as we confess our sins. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you the of my sin. 
Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To you, Lord, of your holy name. Amen. Upon this your confession, I, as a called and ordained servant of God, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together. Almighty God, by the working of your Holy Spirit, grant that we may gladly hear your word proclaimed among us and follow its directing through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament lesson is taken from Jeremiah chapter 28, verses 5 to 9. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to Hananiah the prophet in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord make the words you have prophesied come true and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. Yet hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes to pass, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm we read together, I'll read the first sentence and you the second. Look on my affliction and deliver me. Plead my cause and redeem me. Salvation is far from the wicked. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your just decrees. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries. But I do not swear to I look at the faithless with disgust. Because they do not believe your commandments. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. The sum of your word is truth. And every one of the just as righteous decrees is in the world forever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second reading is from Romans chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? 
Thus, a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and, she marries, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions, aroused by the law, were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive, alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death for me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin producing death in me through what is good in order that sin might be shown to be sin and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's stand for the reading of the gospel. The gospel for today is one of those hard sections of scripture because Jesus says, I haven't come to bring peace on earth, I've come to bring a sword. And we know that when we believe in God, sometimes it's very tough. People uh, are against us because of how we live or what we do, because they don't do that or they don't live that way. It's not easy to be a Christian, but God says, persevere. And persevere we will, because he has life for us in the midst of all this. The Holy Gospel for today is from Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 34. Jesus said, <clears throat> do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemies might be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water 
because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. <clears throat> Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text for today is from the Gospel lesson, Matthew 10, 40 to 42. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me, says Jesus, receives him who sent me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. The one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. A Sunday school teacher couldn't open the combination lock on the supply cabinet. And so she went to the pastor for help. And the pastor went over to the supply cabinet and, and looked up serenely to heaven and mumbled a few things and then he turned his attention back to the combination lock and turned it and opened the lock and the Sunday school teacher said <laughs> I'm in awe of your faith pastor really he said it's nothing the combination is on a piece of paper taped to the ceiling <laughs> I wish all of the answers to life were on a piece of paper taped to the ceiling. And then when we hit difficult times, well, like this in our lives, all we would have to do is look up. I've called today's sermon A Dummy's Guide to Christianity. Because there's a lot of books out there, you know, a dummy's guide to fixing your car or, or uh, uh, whatever. But uh, a dummy's guide to Christianity. Because sometimes we have no idea what's going on. We have no idea what, what we should do. And we need basic answers for what's happening in our life. A Christian author Max Licado, many of you read his devotions and his books. He visited New York City just a few days after the attacks of September 11th, 2001. And he asked his cab driver if his life was any different since the attacks. Oh yes, the driver said, I, I keep getting lost. I always look to the World Trade Center as my landmark. And now that the Twin Towers are gone, I can't get my bearings in the city anymore. And we can relate to that man's problem. When tragedy or this pandemic takes our landmarks away, we have difficulty getting our bearings. We have difficulty setting our directions too. And oh, how we wish that the answers were taped to the ceiling. The Bible. The Bible is a go-to book when we have a question. A question about anything. 
The Bible is our book. Some have called the B-I-B-L-E basic instructions before leaving Earth. <laughs> it's a good way to say it because that's our go-to book. And if we were to write a basic guide for Christians, our text from Matthew 10 that we're looking at today would, would be a good place to begin. Section 1 of our guide to Christianity would carry this heading. When you see Jesus, you see God. Now that's simple enough, isn't it? Jesus says that in our gospel lesson for today. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. When you receive Jesus, you receive God. What is God the Father like? Look to Jesus, you'll see. What happens when I die? Jesus has the answer. When you see Jesus, you see God and how he acts and how he loves and how he gives. This past Thursday night, the mother of Reverend Russ Howard in Dixon died. Um, Russ is in Dixon. His mother lives in Washington State. Russ is our circuit counselor for the Wetaskiwin Circuit. And his mother taught Pastor Russ how to know and love Jesus. She knew Jesus. And like he said to me, now she's in the presence of God, her Father. And he rejoices in that gift. But what makes him so sad is because she lives in the state of Washington and because of the restrictions, because of the COVID virus, he cannot go to the funeral. And he cannot be the presiding pastor there, as she wanted him to be for her. He can't go there. But Pastor Russ rejoices that when you see Jesus, you see God. You see God the Father. And you receive all the gifts he has to give. And that's a wonderful blessing for each of us, too. And that's a blessing that opens up the whole combination of our life. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The gift of eternal life, the gift is yours when you see Jesus. Here's the second part of our guide to Christianity. That was this part, and now this part. When you see your neighbor, you see Christ. Well, not everyone does. But as a Christian, if you want to see how to view your neighbor and treat your neighbor, ask yourself this question. If this was Jesus, how would I treat him? And then act accordingly. In our gospel for today, Jesus says, and whoever gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, Truly I say to you, he will by no means receive or lose his reward. A cup of cold water. 
Let me tell you a fascinating story. During the course of the second and third centuries, in 310, I think, following, a very serious plague struck in Rome, struck the Roman Empire. And this was also the same time that Christians, the Christian faith was starting to grow. And one might think that the new Christians might say, what's going on? I don't think I'm gonna follow this faith because what kind of God would allow all this death and destruction to happen? But strangely enough, this was a time of great church growth. People flocked to the Christian faith because they noted that Christians seemed to be surviving the plagues better than the general population. The reason for this better survival rate was not because God was saving Christians and destroying heathens. The reason was that Christians were taking seriously the command of Jesus in the gospel for today. The command of Jesus to offer a cup of cold water. Christians didn't know how to stop the plagues better than anyone else. But while pagans pulled away from the dying people, the Christians ministered to the dying by giving them food and, and something to drink. And of course, many of those Christians died in this loving act because they too caught the plague. But the number of Christian caregivers who died was dwarfed by the numbers of ill people that recovered because they were given this care this food, this little bit of food, and, and maybe the water that they needed in their dehydration. Yes, that little bit of food and drink they received from these saints was sometimes just enough to help these very ill persons survive the storm and recover. And of course, these people became new Christians. Jesus said, whoever gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, he will not lose his reward. Anytime that we do any good to another human being, we are ministering to Christ himself, to God himself. Who can forget the words of Matthew 25 when Jesus says, when I was hungry, you gave me to drink. I was thirsty and, and you, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. Naked, you clothed me. Sick, you visited me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Inasmuch as you have done it to one of the least of these my brethren, you have done it to me. When you look into the face of your neighbor, you're looking into the face of Christ. The way you would treat Christ is the way you should treat your neighbor with respect, consideration, compassion, and caring. And that's a tall order, isn't it? That's a very tall order. But we as Christians, we can look up and find help from above. So a dummy's guide to Christianity. When you see Jesus, you see God, the Father. When you see your neighbor, you see Jesus. Those should be our two ways of looking at life. 
looking up to see God and get his strength, looking to see those around us who need the help of Jesus and us. We are his arms. We are his members. Fyodor Dostoevsky wrote a novel entitled The Idiot. And it's uh, about a Russian prince who really doesn't fit into society around him because his peers are striving for status and power. They believe in entitlement. In their world, there's no friendship, there's no intimacy. People use one another to gain their own selfish ends. And into this world comes the idiot prince. He doesn't get it at all. He treats everyone, rich or poor, with respect and kindness. He doesn't get it. That makes him so foolish in other people's eyes that they really can't stand how he's acting and, and they laugh at him. But all the same, these empty, cynical, status-seeking people are strangely drawn to him. He's a real dummy, a real idiot, but people love him. To be a Christian, God wants you to look in these two directions. Look to Jesus, and you will be connected with God and all his blessings. Look to others, and you will see Jesus right there in your life and in your world. And let me tell you, when you live that way with these two dimensions, <laughs> when you see things that way, you are no dummy. <laughs> May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds on Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and we'll profess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, <coughs> begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord of our lives and God of our salvation, 
We come to you today in gratitude for the freedoms and blessings you have given us in this dominion called Canada. Help us to appreciate what we have. Help us to caringly nurture and look after our God-given resources. And help us to lovingly extend the hand of faith, fellowship, and Christian care to all of those inside and outside our borders. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our Prime Minister, our Premier, our national, provincial, and municipal leaders, that they may put servanthood and accountability ahead of self-interest and personal gain. And then, O oh Lord, help us to do the same. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those in the Canadian forces who are out of this country on assignment. Keep them safe, protect them, and return them safely home when their tour of duty is ended. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those people in the world who are threatened by warfare, poverty, starvation. Help us in a country of abundance and plenty to find caring and Christian ways to share our resources with those in need. Lord, in your mercy. Bless the governing council of this church and help them with godly wisdom and vision to, to guide grace through this time of pandemic and change. We pray for vision on this road of ministry for you. Show us where you want us to go and how we are to follow you. Lord, in your mercy. We pray today for Jim Olson and Pat Ma receiving treatment for cancer. We pray for their families who share the emotions of their treatment with them. We pray for Letha Bershi with gastrointestinal and heart problems. We pray for Lydia Lehman with her macular degeneration. We pray for Pastor Russ Howard, our circuit counselor, as he deals with the death of his mother. And we pray for all those who are on our minds and in our hearts right now. Look after these people we care for. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for all those graduating from this congregation and community that you would bless them as they move forward into the next stage of their schooling or life, that you would surround them with your presence and direction as they commence new challenges and new opportunities. Lord, in your mercy, we ask all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, for you have had mercy on us, and you have given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Take this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. I'd like to invite those who are helping with communion to come forward. Lamb of God, take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Have mercy. Lamb of God, take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Have mercy on us. Have mercy. Lamb of God, take away the sin of the world. Grant us peace. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given in death for you. We stand and we pray together. Take and drink the communion. The prayer. blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we shed give for you. thanks to you, Almighty God, God that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy, you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. Oh, okay. So if you would wouldn't mind leading us in a prayer on Sure. Okay. Suzanne, the office administrator, has gone for emergency surgery uh, for a twisted bowel. So let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, you're there for us at all times. Thank you for being with your servant Suzanne, and we pray that you'd be with her particularly now at this crucial time. Protect her, keep her safe in your care, and bless the surgeon and, and those who will be dealing with her. Grant her your strength and your healing for we commit her into your care. 
In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes. For those of you who noticed that we didn't have a bulletin this morning, that's the reason why. Uh, in the midst of it, Su uh, Suzanne came down ill um, and ended up with emergency surgery. So I'm not sure exactly when the surgery was taking place, but please keep her in your prayers. Um, just a couple of announcements. I'm not sure yet. Uh, Dave, I, we've indicated to Dave that we are ready to start movie night. Are we going to start this Tuesday or wait till the next so you can advertise it? Okay, so Dave will have a movie on Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. The uh, movie area has been set up. You'll have to adjust chairs depending on couples or whatever, but pretty much the chairs that are out are what we can have for capacity in that area. We can make, make changes accordingly. So anyways, movie night, Tuesday night at 7. Bible study restarts next Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. So that's, yay, that's up and running. I understand that Wednesday devotions have been meeting. So again, that whole area has been set up for you. Again, we're in a position where we can't share food and drink. So if you want to have something Sunday morning or Wednesday morning or whatever, bring your own with you. Uh, that is the reason why we are not having fellowship downstairs following the service, because we don't have a plan in place yet to set that up because again the sharing of food and drink is something that is extremely frowned upon by Alberta Health so uh, just keep that in mind and um, uh, worship committee met on last this past Wednesday and I'm going to hand this over to um, to Donna who is our vocalist and our musician and she's going to explain to you some of the decisions that we came to. Uh, while things are changing, some things we're going to have to take a step back from. So anyways, Donna. So uh, what I mostly want to talk with you about this morning is why singing is considered uh, a high risk behavior as a group activity um, because to produce a tone there needs to be a, a greater amount and a larger force behind the air all of those droplets that come as we make consonant sounds uh, and vocalized sounds are projected two and a half times farther than they would be if you coughed without a mask. Also, there are small, tiny particles of, of droplets that are aerosolized. That means they stay in the air. The larger droplets drop down, but those small, smaller particles go into the air and stay in the air. So when you take your breath in to continue singing, those droplets are drawn farther down into the lungs. And so those are the concerns. I would encourage you, though, to continue singing on your own. There are so many ways and places to praise the Lord. There are all the traditional ones, like singing in the shower, right? And singing in the rain. We can do those. We can sing together outside, socially distanced. So things in our worship time will be different for a while. We'll be adding things back slowly. But those are the reasons why. We can affirm with the hymn writer, uh, no, no storm can shake my inmost calm while to that rock I'm clinging since Christ is Lord of heaven and earth. How can I keep from singing? So keep on singing. If you have any questions, um, uh, please come and talk to me. I've been researching this because it's my job. Thank you. God bless.
go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.